Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome. I'm glad to have you with us here today for our first edition of uh, the Curiosity Desk, uh, sort of live from home. We're at home with the Curiosity Desk, and I am Edgar B. Herwick III, host of the Curiosity Desk. And uh, appropriately, I am coming to you from my home. I'm really happy to have you with us. For those of you who have been with us for our Boston Talks events in the past, both in person and digitally here on the old internet, uh, it's sort of a similar uh, thing. You're gonna uh, sort of really kind of recognize what we're doing here with you today. And we are very, very glad to have you with us. Uh, just like our Boston Talks, we have a theme for today and that is keeping it creative during COVID, and we've got two really good speakers who I am really looking forward to hearing from. Kristen Fentroy, who is a, Kirsten Fentroy, who is a soloist with Boston Ballet, and Corey DePina, who is a hip hop maven and a youth educator, and uh, both incredibly creative people who are normally doing their thing with people physically. Uh, and we're gonna hear about how they're kind of adjusting in this more virtual world that we are all living in. We are, of course, a smarter happy hour, so don't be afraid to grab yourself a, a tasty brew. I've got one myself, even though it is only four o'clock. Heck, our friends in Western Europe, it's well into the evening. Even in Halifax, Nova Scotia, it's five o'clock. So we hope you will participate. Before we get started, I'm gonna introduce a couple of my colleagues who are gonna walk you through a little bit of what you can and can't do here with us for the next hour. Hi, everyone, welcome. I'm Abby, so glad to have you here. And just a reminder that unlike us, you will not be on camera and we won't be able to hear you unless we are called upon during our trivia. Hi, I'm Bailey. I'm gonna be hanging in the Q&A. We wanna hear all your questions and by asking your question, you have to open up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can type it in. Be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from when you submit your question. So your question that you wanna hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. Thanks everyone, we hope you enjoy the event. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Bailey. Thanks again to you for being with us. It's going to be a fun hour, so we hope you will stick around. Don't be afraid to go and grab yourself a drink and sort of relax with us for the next hour. We're also, uh, for the record, going to be having some polls that will pop up on your screen throughout the next hour. So please feel free to participate in those if you see them. Also, if you're feeling like, you know what, I don't want to be involved with this poll, you can just X out of it. But we uh, do love to hear from you. So here's an example right there. Have you attended a WGBH event before? Let us know, just click in on that poll and uh, we will let you know what the results are as we move through the afternoon. So again, I'm Edgar, I'm coming to you uh, live from my home. This is at home with the Curiosity Desk and uh, without any further ado, I wanna bring our first speaker to the screen, Kirsten Fentroy is a soloist with uh, Boston Ballet which as you might suspect uh, is uh, like the rest of us during COVID kind of dealing with being shut down. Uh, Kirsten, thanks for being with us uh, live from home. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, I'm glad that you're happy. I'm happy to have you. So uh, maybe to start us off uh, before we get into what's going on with Boston Ballet and everything, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. What is it to be a soloist with Boston Ballet and what was the journey for you to get there? Sure, um, I think I'll start with the journey. Uh, I think it's the easiest place to start. Uh, I started dancing in Los Angeles, that's where I'm from. I grew up there. Um, my mom was my ballet teacher. My dad was a commercial dancer, so I was on different kinds of dance teams growing up, so I was well-versed in different places in the dance world. Um, I moved to New York to study ballet full-time, where I studied at the Joffrey Ballet School for two years before looking to find myself in a professional dance company and take it on as a job. I auditioned for the Dance Theater of Harlem, where I was for five years, and I was one of their leading dancers there, but I was really hungry for something different because Dance Theater of Harlem was primarily a touring company, and I, I wanted to find myself in a place where I didn't have to travel so much. I have a dog, so I didn't want to have to like find a place for my dog to stay all of the time anymore. Um, so I started looking for companies that um, did different kinds of rep that I was interested in and Boston Ballet was at the top of my list. So I auditioned and ended up here and um, I've been here for three years. I joined as a corps de ballet member, which means I was in like the larger group of dancers, um, usually in the back of the stage if you're doing a full length ballet, so not usually doing leading roles. I was promoted during my first year to second soloist, which meant that I did 
the list roles, but also still had to do those corps de ballet roles. And then during my second year, I was promoted to first soloist, and that's where I am now. That's a pretty intense journey. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you sort of talk about the idea that you were exposed to a lot of different kinds of dancing. And, and also, interestingly, it sounds like, based on your parents' background, also like the kind of jobs one could have in dancing as well. So like both from a from an artistic and a professional standpoint, what was it about ballet that kind of, of all the kinds of dancing sort of drew you in? I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. I hated doing ballet when I was a kid because it's like, you know, you think about ballet and you're, it's like so strict and, and, and it's so structured. It's hard to like wrap your head around as a kid, I think. And I just wanted to have fun. So I was really into doing jazz and hip hop and tap where I can make a lot of noise and stuff like that. Um, but when I got older, I was looking for something that was a little bit more of a challenge. And I went away to study for over the summer one year um, at American Ballet Theater Summer Intensive, um, which means that I was dancing all day, every day for three weeks. And sometimes these intensives go up to like six weeks. Um, but this one was three weeks. And having to get myself up in the morning, go to the studio, work all day, come home exhausted, still have to feed myself and then like get up and do it all over again. I fell in love with that, um, with that responsibility. And I fell in love with the fact that like, it's never perfect and there's always something to work towards. Um, and I think that that made me really wanna stick to ballet. So when I moved to New York and, and I full time and I studied at Joffrey Ballet School, um, I really like fully submerged myself in the ballet world. I got a job working in the offices there. And I um, used that time because I had, I had their keys. I had to like lock up after I was done. So I would like stay really late into the evening and like work on my ballet technique. And I knew I was like behind. I was a little bit older than, than a lot of my, um, my peers and my classes. So I had like some catching up to do, but um, yeah. And then I just really pursued it and dedicated my time to it. I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, if you have questions for Kirsten, we want to know what they are. You can pop them into that Q&A section. I'll be keeping an eye on that, and uh, I'll make sure to ask as many of your questions of her as we get. So let's talk about the last few months. Uh, I imagine it's been a little bit weird. Uh, yeah. where, where, what, like, where were you at when this whole thing started with Boston Ballet, and like, what's it been like since? You know, funny enough, we were in the middle of a run of shows. So we usually do maybe about two weeks of the same performance. Um, and then we'll maybe do another one back to back right after that. But in we were in the middle of this run when things kind of really started to unravel. And we were really wondering how much longer we were going to be able to be in a theater where there's like hundreds of people in the audience sitting next to each other. We were hearing about other companies that were closing down. Um, and we, so we ended up finishing that run of shows somehow, and we were preparing for the show that was going to come right after that. And it was opening night of the next show. We were in our final rehearsal of the day, uh, right before the, the curtain would have gone up and our artistic director came on stage and told us they were canceling the shows and sent us home. And, and, and it was just like, so strange and so surreal to just like, be on opening night, like basically getting mentally ready to go on stage and, and just get sent home. And all of the audience members couldn't come and all of these things. And we didn't know what was next. And so they, they wanted us to rehearse from home for a little bit, study some videos. So we knew the choreography for the next program that was coming next. And, um, and shortly after that, we found out that the rest of our season got canceled. And that was just really hard, um, especially if you can imagine you ballet dancers like the only way for us to like truly work on our craft is to be in a studio and to be in a room where where you have to be close to other people and we didn't have access to that we were trying to keep our bodies in shape at home we were trying to do ballet classes in our living rooms with whatever and and it was like super challenging and, and there was a huge learning curve i had to figure out you know how can i do this safely from home um and all <laughs> all the meanwhile, like not knowing when I was going to go back into the studio. And it's been five months now. And, you know, we still aren't back rehearsing yet. And we aren't back in the theater yet. So, so how are you doing? Wild. Yeah, like, like <laughs> how are you, like, what are you doing? And how are you doing it? Like, are you doing a lot of like, 
dancing, keeping your, like, I mean, like ballet dancers are like high performance athletes. You know, we were talking about like elite athletes. Like I imagine if you take a week off, you would know in your body that you took a week off and yet you're talking yeah, about that's true. Months, so like, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, imagine, like, on our normal rehearsal days, we're working Monday through Saturday from 9.45 till 6.30. Straight through. And taking that away, it's so hard to get your body to 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 stay in the same kind of tuned-up shape that it usually is in. Um, to be completely honest with you, I had surgery in May. I was dealing with an injury. Um, so I, I kind of had the silver lining that I was able to, to take a break from dancing. But before that, before I even knew that I was going to be able to have the surgery because the hospitals were closed and everything like that. Oh, great. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was trying different things because I felt like doing ballet at home made me sad a lot of the time because it just reminded me of what I wasn't able to do. And so yeah. I tried to experiment with different things. I tried taking different kinds of dance classes through the internet, through like Zoom. Um, I like what tried- kind? Wait, 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 like what kinds of-, wait, what kind of <laughs> I got really into Zumba strong classes. They're like <laughs> the Zumba classes that are more um, like high intensity, high intensity interval training classes. They aren't really dancing, but they put it to music and the music part made me really into it. And so they were super hard and I felt like I was getting a good workout. So I got really into those for a while. Um, we were, I was like trying to, to do ballet, holding onto a countertop in my kitchen and I was like getting blisters on my hands from like gripping the countertop. So I ended up buying one of those like suction things that you put in a shower to like help you get in and out of the shower. And I would suction it to my countertop and use that as a ballet bar instead. I got really creative. <laughs> That's crazy. How, and how are you, like what's the esprit de corps like among the folks in Boston Ballet? Like is it is it terribly collaborative normally? Are you like swapping ideas? And you know, is it is it pretty interactive? And if so, how are you staying in touch with your colleagues and fellow dancers and keeping that alive? you know, sort of during this time of not being around each other? Mm -hmm. I think the dancer community is a really strongly connected one, whether you are in the same company as someone else or in another company. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of communicating. We were at the very beginning of this, especially, we were FaceTiming each other all of the time, trying to check in and make sure that everyone was okay. Um, and, and taking classes, the same classes, even though we couldn't see each other, taking the same classes online that were live, together so we felt like we were together um swapping ideas as far as like workouts and 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 just continuing to talk to each other because it's it's really hard a lot of dancers spend their actually i think i can say most ballet dancers spend their entire lives training to to do ballet and you take that piece away and they kind of lose a bit of their identity and so i think that not only was this like really scary for a lot of people but there was a little bit of like an identity crisis for dancers and it, it's been really hard mentally for a lot of dancers. Have so it's you, important to kind of like stay together. Yeah I, I mean has that is that something that's affected you like you know both I mean you talk about it I mean it's, it's sort of double it's sort of double whammy I, it strikes me with something that you do because one it's your job it's your livelihood and you're not doing that so that's its own kind of crisis but then also it's this like highly physical thing that you also are not doing, right? So then you have this physiological like sort of, mm -hmm. but, like that's a double whammy and like, has that affected you? Have you felt that? Yeah, I definitely did. And especially because of the, the period where I, where I had my surgery, I'm, I'm almost fully recovered now. I had surgery on my ankle. Um, so I really had to like sit down. I, I couldn't even do the exercises that kind of like burn that energy and you know, as, as a dancer, I think that a lot of, a lot of our energy is like very passion driven. Um, so it's not just like I'm a very energetic person and I like to do things all of the time because like being completely real, I don't like doing my laundry, you know, like, it's not like I just am trying to burn energy doing things that I don't want to yeah, do. Yeah. It's like, I, I have energy when I'm dancing because it, it fuels me in a way that, that thing, other things in life don't. Um, so it was, I had to kind of like redirect that in order, in order to keep myself healthy in my brain. Um, it got, and there were, there were times that it was really hard. And so after I had my surgery and I really did have to sit down, I had to find ways to kind of like funnel that energy and 
find ways to drive that passion driven energy that like was in me but didn't know where to go and and it was just making me really confused and sad yeah so uh we've got uh, some questions popping up in the q a this one comes from sarah in bill ricka and she wants to know what so it, this ties into what we were talking about how like how have you stayed motivated to keep dancing you know amidst all of this like what is the thing that is motivating you to like continue to do something um i think it's it's like that little bit of hope i think that i a lot of like things that i run my life with are are driven with hope it's like knowing that I, I will be back and i will be able to do this again that's keeping me motivated and not wanting to when i get back into the studio not wanting it to be incredibly hard when i get back because i haven't done anything because if you know like you were saying like you take you take these like we have these six days a week from 9 45 to 6 30 and like our bodies are in like a very specific shape and take all of that away and you try to jump back into the studio without that for five months it's just going to be incredibly difficult so the other side of that coin is that you know you were talking about you know the fact that like this is like a really grueling way to make a living like your body has to be in incredible shape like you said you're you know you're working out in these long stretches day in day out it's also like insanely competitive you know you are a soloist at boston ballet so there's probably 200 dancers like just waiting to like jump in there as soon as you like lose a step so is there like a little part of you that like the fact that like everything has shut down like that maybe gives you a chance to like take a deep breath for the first time in years <laughs> yeah this is kind yeah. of yeah yeah and i think that a lot of my peers felt the same way too and we were we had just finished a really hard program and so we were all very tired and we were getting ready for another really hard program and so i think the break was welcome at first but you know then it kept going and it, and it kept going and and like from my perspective i like i said i i was i was dealing with an injury so i was in a lot of pain and i was going to end up pushing through to the end of the season which would have been all the way through the end of may with this pain and like with this frustration that i was already dealing with and so i i, I think i personally really needed a little bit of a break and and i think for me that was like kind of the silver lining was being able to have the time uh, to to actually sit down and and let my body heal without the like FOMO, the fear of missing out, um, that would have come with like not being able to perform. You know, have you learned anything about yourself during this yeah. like kind of time? Like, I mean, I think all of us to a certain extent are being a little bit more reflective because we're kind of forced yeah. to, right? Like, yeah. So you know, what about you? Have you been have you been experiencing it? like have you learned about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had a lot of time to reflect. And um, one of the things that I think I'm like most proud of myself come well, whenever we come out of this, this period, um, will be that I've really learned where my voice is and a lot of topics that that really mattered to me. So circling back to kind of where I started my professional career with the Dance Theatre of Harlem, um, this company was built in, or was originated in 1969 uh, in response to um, the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, it was created by Arthur Mitchell, who was the first African-American principal dancer with New York City Ballet, which is one of the most, the biggest ballet companies in Northern America. Um, and so there's, there was like a lot of history that that company was built on. And part of the mission as a dancer is is to or part of the mission of the company in general is to do community outreach and to reach out to different kinds of people um and and um i guess it's also important to acknowledge that this company was created to give opportunities to people of color um because historically ballet ha it hasn't been welcome for people of all all skin tones um and and someone that that is darker than the other person wouldn't be welcome in many companies um but that's that's why it's so um uh, people people love it so much when they see these people of color in these like major ballet companies today because because there is this like kind of invisible barrier that's been put up. Um, so starting my career with Dance Theater of Harlem, I was sort of trained to find my my like my advocacy muscle or my that that ability to to dance with a purpose that is bigger than you and 
and I was I was given the opportunity to teach for for different kinds of kids in different communities and all of these different places. I performed for many different audiences, and 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 it made me fall in love with having a purpose a purpose other than just like dancing. Yeah. Um, and and so when I left Dance Theater of Harlem, I was looking for something for myself, um, like a, a different kind of challenge for myself. I had never performed a full length ballet. So you think about these like tutu ballets, like the Sleeping Beauty or Swan Lake. I had never done one of those because Dance Theater of Harlem was only 16 dancers at the time. And you can't do that with that many dancers. Um, and so I, I really wanted that, that to dive into the classical ballet. And I, I wanted that challenge. So I started looking at other places and I found myself at Boston Ballet. And when I joined the company, I was the first African-American woman to join this company in 10 years. And I'm still the only African-American woman here. And so lately, in, in response to the murder of George Floyd and the, the like upward movement of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, a lot of people have been reaching out to their peers of color to, to ask them for help in understanding things or um, the, what their experiences are and things like that. And, and knowing how historically difficult it's been for people of color in the ballet world, a lot of people have been turning to dancers of color for the same reasons. And so I, I have always wanted to use my art to make a difference, but I didn't know how to do it. And so having this time where I couldn't physically dance has given me the space to really figure out how valuable my voice is and, and not be ashamed to say how I feel and say what my experiences are and say why maybe this was wrong, but also be like, maybe this is how we can change it. And, and so I've been spending time learning how to talk. I, I wrote an essay for a night for like one of a really well known ballet magazine called Point Magazine, which was really cool to like have my words published in writing. Um, and I joined a couple of committees and I, I, I helped start a mentorship program for students of color in Boston Ballet. And like, I've been really trying to like channel my energy in another way. And that's kind of like where that passion driven energy is going, like circling back to the passion driven energy thing. I, I found another channel for it. And now I have the challenge or the opportunity to kind of figure out how I can like do those things hand in hand, how I can like have my passion driven Bridge energy in dancing, but also, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, we are quickly running out of time. This is amazing. So I want to do some rapid fire uh, questions at you from our audience here. Oh man, here we go. So here we go. Uh, number one, this one comes from Janice. What kind of music do you practice to? Ooh, it depends on my mood. Sometimes I like classical. Sometimes I like to listen to like hip hop. Um, I've been like liking to jump to the song Savage. The, you know, I'm a savage. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it depends on my mood. We did a ballet to uh, to James Blake's music, and so I've also been like really passionate about list about like his music as well lately. All right. Question number two, coming from an an, an an anonymous attendee, what is your response to someone who says ballet is not a sport? Ooh. Um, hmm. I would say that you're right, ballet is not a sport because it's not something you get points for doing um, and you don't play games, but we are equally, if not more athletic than a lot of athletes and you have to do it gracefully and make it not look painful. That's a pretty good answer. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, question from Julie. Are you back in the studio now working on stuff or is it still all from home? Um, so Boston Ballet has opened up the studios um, for dancers to do voluntary workout, but it's only one or two at a time or in very small pods and you have to follow a lot of safety procedures. So the company itself is not rehearsing yet, but we're supposed to start back in September. All right. Two more questions. One from Joanna, uh, who uh, you had mentioned your parents early on. So the question is, uh, did one of them have a dance studio or teach in one? Were they both professional dancers? What, what, was, the, what was the parental background? They were both teachers. Uh, they were both my teachers at some, at one point, at least. Uh, my mom danced for a couple of different classical ballet companies. Um, the the one that I love to talk about is the Cairo Opera in Egypt because I just think that it's so cool that she danced abroad for a while. Um, but several regional companies in California. My dad was a commercial dancer, so he did hip hop and things like that. But he was primarily like a hip hop and jazz teacher, and he had his own dance team. But neither of them had their own studio. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you two more now. Go ahead. Uh, number one, 
are you on TikTok? Can we find you there? <laughs> no, I'm not on TikTok. I'm sorry. But I do know the Savage Dance. <laughs> and, and finally, final question here before I let you go. Will there be a Nutcracker this year? That is a question that I am also wondering. Like, if you look around the country and you look at all these other ballet companies, so many people have canceled their Nutcracker already. So I'm hoping that if we don't, have like a physical nutcracker in the theater that we're able to do something virtually at least. I hope so. I love the nutcracker. Do you, or do you hate the nutcracker? Look, I started my career with Dance Theater Problem who didn't have a nutcracker. So I've only been doing it for three years. And so I think that I still have that like excitement about like doing different roles every time and like getting to do new, like this year I got to do the Sugar Plum Fairy for the first time, which was major for me. Um, so yeah, I, I still love doing the Nutcracker. It gets old towards like show number 35, but. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Kirsten, we wish you the best uh, and Boston Ballet the best. And thank you for taking some time out of your day to uh, give us a little insight into your world and how you're uh, living during these crazy times. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. That's Kirsten Fentroy. She is with the Boston Ballet Soloist. Thank you all for those uh, questions in the Q&A. Sorry I wasn't able to get to all of them. Uh, we'll continue to do our best with that. We've got some, uh, a little bit of a tradition here to do some trivia, which we're going to do in just a second. Uh, but before we get to the trivia, and don't forget we have another speaker coming up, Corey DePina, who I'm really looking forward to talking to. Uh, but before we get to all of that, I'm going to kick things over to my colleague, Alicia, who's got a couple of things to talk to you about. Hey, everybody. Thank you for spending this hour with us, uh, this virtual hour. Uh, and this is so much fun talking about creativity in these times of isolation. WGBH brings you a wide variety of events made possible thanks to people like you who really care about the work that we do. So if you haven't already, we'd like to encourage you to become a sustaining member or make a donation. And you can wear your support for WGBH on your sleeve or maybe right on the front, kind of like Superman style, with our Heather Gray t-shirt with the WGBH logo on it in orange. So please sign on as a sustaining member to WGBH. When you do that at $7.50 a month, well, thank you with the t-shirt. This is a limited offer, so you want to get in on it today. You know, it's hot out, but we've got you covered because this t-shirt is soft, it's light, it's comfortable. So, you know, you can feel good about supporting WGBH and be fashionable at the same time. It feels good, right? So all it takes is $7.50 a month, or you can give a one-time gift of $90. So how do you do that? You can go to wgbh.org slash support events to make your donation and get the shirt. So really, you know, it's not about the shirt. Now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed on what's happening in the world. And you know, your contribution helps us provide information that you can trust along with events like this that you really enjoy. So go ahead, support us. You'll be able to find a link later on, check it out. Hey, Edgar, back to you. Thank you, Alicia. I mean, you guys heard it. I think she said soft, light, and comfortable. I mean, where else can you find that in a shirt? I mean, this sounds like a pretty sweet thing to get your hands on right now. All right, it is trivia time, and I'm gonna explain to you how we try to do this uh, in our virtual space. And that is, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that you can, I believe, sort of raise your hand. And the idea here is uh, sight unseen. If you wanna participate in trivia, we've just got a couple of questions. Uh, you can raise your hand. We are gonna call on a couple of people at random to take their hand and try it in a trivia question. Now it should be said, there's absolutely no prize for this. So essentially, you don't really stand to gain much by getting a question right. And you could embarrass yourself in front of all of these people watching if you get it wrong. But it is the bravery of our audience that we count on and that we love. So if you do want to try your hand at a trivia question right now, then go ahead and raise your hand. And if you get selected, you should know, we're going to pop your audio on. So you and I will be able to talk to each other, but do not worry, we will not see you. So uh, if you're in your pajamas or whatever, that's totally fine. We're only going to hear you. So right now, if you want to play some trivia, raise those hands up in the air, or I guess click the button that says that your hand is being raised. Either way, we're gonna pick one of you and we'll go ahead and uh, try a little trivia question with you right now. <clears throat> uh oh, looks like my, my screen, which I think means we've got somebody on the air here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. And uh, who am I speaking with right now? 
My name is Ron. Ron, in how Somerville. you doing? Ron, you're in okay. Somerville. I am in Somerville as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you, what's going on right now. Well, I'm a computer programmer um, sitting at home right now. Uh, not especially interesting, but uh, trying to stay cool in, in the summer heat. Yeah, I hear you there. All right, Ron, thank you for uh, being such a brave volunteer and the first one with us today. So you get uh, our first question, which actually comes courtesy of Kirsten, our first speaker. Uh, she and, uh, and Corey helped me out with a little bit of trivia. So this is a ballet question coming at you. And don't worry, it is multiple choice. So here we go, Ron. Here, uh, here is your question. Now, uh, most of the moves in ballet from, uh, are sort of named in French. And I'm going to give you the, the, the name of four ballet moves. Now, three of these moves are real, and one of them is completely made up. I want you to tell me which is made up. So we've got a plie. We've got a pendu. We've got an omwati, and we've got an omblata. So plie, tendu, omwati, and omblata, which is not a real ballet move. I'm going to guess the last one, Om Blata. That sounds too much like a Beatles song. <laughs> Om Blata is correct. Ron, you kicked us off right. You got it correct. It actually does uh, sound a lot like Obla Di Obla, although Om Di Om Blata. If somebody right. hasn't done that already, they should do that. Like that sounds like a ballet that should be done. Uh, maybe Kirsten can choreograph that and uh, make up what an Om Blata is. But well done, Ron. Thank you so much for playing trivia with us. And we're going to move over to Emily for our next trivia question. Emily, how you doing? Are you there, Emily? I'm here. Hi. Emily, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Where are you coming to us from today? From Brighton. Brighton, Massachusetts. That's, uh, I used to go to work <laughs> in Brighton, Massachusetts. That's where the WGBH newsroom is. But I haven't been there in months. Remember those days. Uh. I remember those days. I remember those days. All right, are you ready to play some trivia? Ready. Okay. Your question is about the month that we are currently experiencing right now, the month of August. Okay. okay. So August uh, is named after Caesar Augustus, right? It got its name in 8 BC. But uh, the month that we now call August was around for quite some time before it got the name August. So. I'm going to give you three choices, and I want you to tell me what the original name for the month that we now call August was, all right? Ready. Okay. Was it called Volcana, named after the Roman fire god because it happened in a very hot time of the year? Was it called Sextilis, uh, because March actually used to be the first, first month, which made what we now call August the sixth month, so it was named Sextilis because it was the sixth month in the old calendar? Or was it called Minervember, named after Minerva, who is the Roman goddess of wisdom, art, and craft, and this was the time of the year in Rome where many festivals were held? So was August originally called Volcana, Sextilis, or Minervember? Minervember. I think it's the uh, B, the second option. Sex, sextilis. Yes, yes. That is absolutely correct. We are two for two on our trivia question. Indeed, the month of August was the sixth month in the old 10-month calendar. Uh, and again, it became August after Caesar Augustus in 8 BC. Well done. Nailed it. Nailed it. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, let's do two more quick questions. Do we have any more volunteers for us to play some quick trivia with us here? I think we got another one. We're two for two. And it looks like we might have Janice. Janice, can you hear me? Maybe we have Janice, maybe we don't have Janice. Janice, are you with us? All right. I don't think we have Janice right now, so maybe we will try another volunteer for some trivia. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get some trivia going. Uh, in the meantime, just want to say thanks again to everybody for being with us here uh, on the... Uh, oh, looks like we may now have another volunteer. Sarah, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? I can. Sarah, where are you calling from? 
I'm from over in Billerica. Billerica, Billerica, Massachusetts. I was actually in Billerica not too long ago. How are things in Billerica today? You know, I can't complain. Um, haven't really left my house, but regardless, we're here. All right. Do you have air conditioning? I do. Very important. Thank you for being with us, and I'm glad you have air conditioning. All right. Uh, so uh, we're going to give you another multiple choice question. And uh, we were just talking with a dancer. So your question is about the word choreography. We all know that choreography means to sort of come up with a dance. Uh, I'm going to give you multiple choice here. And I want you to tell me where the root of the word choreography really comes from. Does it come from the Greek and is related to the word chorus? Does it come from Old English slash German and it's related to the word chord, implying two intertwined bodies? Or is it from the Latin related to the word we use now for choir, implying a group of people working together? So does it come from the Greek, from the German, Old English, or from the Latin? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, my guess is going to be Greek. You're going with the Greek. Do you, can you tell us why you're going with the Greek? Um, you feeling Greek? Feeling it? I, I think I'm feeling it. And... Um, I know that there's such thing as a Greek chorus um, and choria, which is dancing in unison in Greek. So maybe. That's exactly right. Well, oh, cool. How do you know so much about like ancient Greek? That's incredible. You like hit it right on the head. Choria is dancing in a group, which is sort of what was done in these choruses. And that's where the word choreography comes from. You 100% nailed it. But how do you know that? Um, I have a degree in literature. So I learned a lot about root words um, throughout college. Amazing. Sarah, great call. Congratulations. We are three for three on trivia. Nailing it. Let's do one more quick trivia question. This one comes courtesy of our next speaker, Corey DePina. So uh, we need one more person and then we're going to kick it over to Corey. And I think we've got Janice. Janice, are you with me? Janice, are you muted perhaps? I don't think we have Janice. Should we try one more person? In the meantime, thanks again for being with us for At Home with the Curiosity Desk. We are literally at home. I am in the Curiosity Desk home office in Somerville, Massachusetts. Trying to stay cool, hope you are too. Uh, we are really thankful that you are with us. Uh, we've got Corey coming up, who's uh, a great speaker, really interesting human being. I'm really looking forward to talking to him. Keep in mind that you've got the Q&A tab. So if you've got questions for Corey as I'm chatting with him, please pop them in there. I'll be keeping an eye on that. And uh, I think we're just going to move on uh, unless uh, Janice, can you hear me? Or is there anybody on the line to play trivia? All right, technical difficulties. We've all been there on Zoom in the last few months. No problem whatsoever. I sort of feel like it makes us all, uh, makes us all human. We're all in this together. We've all experienced this. So uh, I want to bring Corey onto the screen. Uh, and uh, once we get Corey up here, we will be off. And there he is. There he is. There Corey, I am. Good. Corey DePina. Corey DePina, uh, is it fair to call you a hip hop maven? Would that be, would you say that that's a, well, that's, is that a fair hmm. maven? A that, would be a, that would be a first. Expert, maven, connoisseur. I am hip hop, let's just say that. It, it's me, I, I'm it. it. <laughs> he is the man who is hip hop, also a, a youth educator. Uh, Corey, thanks for taking some time to chat with us today. Corey, See, I got my that, back. Is that you behind you? I got my own back today, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Edgar, it's a pleasure to be here, man. Thank you for having me here. Kirsten was amazing. Yeah. yeah right? Unbelievable. I think, I think you and Kirsten should think about getting together and maybe you write some music for her to do a like original ballet too. I feel like there could be something in that, right? Yeah, I'm really about it, man. She's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is that picture behind you taken? Where are you there? That was in East Boston, down the street from where I work, Zoomex, uh, right at the harbor front. Uh, I just did a photo shoot with a buddy, and uh, yeah, it came out dope. It was for a, a radio show called Above the Basement. Amazing. So uh, Zoomex is one of these organizations that I feel like is just one of the coolest things. Like, it's, it, it's like a true gem in Boston. And um, 
I'm always, I, I sort of always feel like more people should know about it than do. But um, tell us, for those of us who don't know, tell us about what you do at ZoomX or how you're involved with them and just what they are, because ZoomX is awesome. Yeah, man, you're right. It's an amazing space. I went, in 1992, I went to someone's living room. Little did I know that that place would grow to be like one of the best nonprofits in New England. Uh, in 2011, we got recognized by the uh, White House Arts and Humanities Council, uh, Arts and Humanities Award, which is really dope. But I started going there, really just going after school to someone's house, and then it, it evolved. I started to learn about facilitating and doing programs, dove into the world of music. I was really into hip hop, really into technology. Uh, public schools didn't really work for me. So I was uh, really happy to like find like a space where I could like be myself. And also then they invested in me, which then got me to a point where I can now teach there and help other uh, musicians become really great youth workers and teaching artists and help uh, on a state level with many decisions when it comes to creative youth development and really be into a thing that we call in my work, self-actualization. Self-actualization. Yeah. So what do, you, what, what do you teach there? Like what are, what, what, what are the things that happen at ZoomX? Like what, what does that yeah. mean? Teach it, it started like a seed little thing. It was like a whole bunch of, R&B and hip hop people from the projects in Maverick that wanted to do something and we had a voice and we had our bodies to move. So we started with like a songwriting program. It was like, we need some instruments because we need music. And it evolved to like a music mentorship, instrumental music program. They were like, yo, we need a PA system and some sound. So then we started like a whole technical department with like live sound, engineering and studio. And they were like, yo, we got all this music. We got these thoughts, we got these songs. We need a radio station. So then we like got our own FM license and started a radio station and like did a big capital campaign and turned the old firehouse into a home and we have all these people that work there and do all types of stuff my area is like songwriting and performance and particularly with a lens on like literacy and creative writing because i'm an mc first and, a, and an artist and then so to be a good mc you got to be a good writer to be a good writer you got to have a good imagination and blah 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 so i dove into literacy and really like trying to get that so i'm in schools teaching poetry connecting people with the voice and the power of your voice and being able to like really uh, have people think about creative learning and how they play a role in that. So you say you're an MC first. What, uh, how did you, how did you sort of come to being an MC? Like at what point, like how old were you when you were like, oh yeah, now I'm an MC? Like at what uh, point in your head were you an MC? The point, the point when I wanted to become a better MC was around my community. And my oldest brother was taking me for a doctor's appointment in Kenmore Square. There's like a, a hospital there with a, one of those uh, old parking lots with a spiral that goes up. And we were going up to my doctor's appointment in the levels of the, of the, of the hospital in the parking lot. And there was public enemies, don't believe the hype. And at that time, I thought Flavor Flav was saying, don't believe the height because we're going higher in elevation. <laughs> So I was like, this dude's talking about something that I'm living. This music is more than just rhythm. What is he saying? I feel it. And I was like, I can use that too. And then I went to church and sang in the choir. And then when I went to Zoomix and they gave me like a little bit of like support and some direction and the space to feel safe to like really voice my opinion, it kind of just took off, you know? Cool. Uh, question from one of our attendees over here in the Q&A. Uh, you just mentioned uh, Public Enemy and Flavor Flav, but what uh, what other artists uh, inspired you to sort of become an MC, become a rapper yourself? The the ones that the, the ones that are the strongest and most impactful are my local friends, right? There was a guy named Radioactive, who like I would sit in the Harvard Square with and beatbox and freestyle, right? My boy Mo Pote was in the group called Still Gold. Um, all these people that I grew up with, uh, um, you know, Ed O G, Acrobatic, Mister Lift you know, terminology, like Static Selecta, all these people in my community that, that are still there, they still inspire me. John Glass, uh, the Archetype, like all these people are out here and I feel like we were teenagers doing it then and we're all adults trying to do it now and make a living off of still what we love to do. Um, and it's taken me everywhere from like Boston back to like my homeland of Cape Verde in Africa or off the west coast of Africa where I'm like trying to build a school there now in a studio for people like myself because I imagine if I grew up there without a community and support I'd have nothing so I'm giving a little bit back there from everything that I've learned by going to Zoomix and being a person at Zoomix who can do it. Uh, you just sort of you just sort of very quickly threw something out there that I want to go back to did you just say you're working on building a studio in Cape Verde 
Yeah, yeah. I man, I, I started the Fulu project. It's, it's my own little thing where like, uh, through Zoomex and through my experiences and friends and being around like a philanthrop like philanthropy and knowing that dreams can come true, uh, the Mass Cultural Council gave me the opportunity to go out there in 2017 and do some hip hop history courses and really study my ancestry and teach hip hop on the different islands. I went there, literally climbed the mountain, saw a photo of me and my grandma when I was a baby at the top of the mountain in this old hut that my grandma grew up in and was like, this is amazing, I'm here for a purpose thought that I could give back, started just collecting like some real small instruments and a little bit of money here and there. And right now I'm almost at like 15 grand, over 200 instruments. And I'm figuring out like who's gonna receive it and how I'm gonna set it up there for them so they can have a place to have access. Cause they don't really have nothing over there. They have very little. That's incredible. Cause of hip hop, man. Cause of Zoomix. Cause of like people being inspired. You're asking people like, how are we dealing with COVID? We're like in self actualization and like. Well, how are you? Well, you know? How are you dealing with COVID, right? Like, I mean, like you you seem to have like this ebullient positive attitude, but like these are these are kind of tough times, and they're times that are hitting communities mm. of color a little bit harder. How how are you negotiating all this right now? It's really interesting because I've had a, a tough life. You know, so people are just catching up to my tough times <laughs> and through hip hop and through being like the underdog most of my life. Right now, I feel really confident in hip hop. I feel really confident in being the abstract weird teacher. I've dove into classical music. I'm learning the double bass, uh, which I thought I was never good to learn before or never had the discipline or the obedience to. I'm like really loving it now. I'm diving into like supporting my friends and figuring out communities and what life might be like after this. I'm very lucky, I'm spoiled. I grew up having to deal with like identity issues and like police brutality through my culture a long time ago. And then also then to like think about like caring about other people. I learned that through Zoomix, like wearing a mask and things of like reaching out. As soon as COVID happened, I like went to my clique, went to my community, I went to my friends and we've been there supporting each other since. A lot of people don't have it as easy because they might not have what I have or the, the, the bone or the muscle matter or built, like I'm built, but I can help them get stronger. You know, that's, that's kind of where it comes from, the idea of like self-actualization again. You know, yeah. the, uh, she talked about earlier, Chris, to talk about being in shape. You know, I gotta be in shape too, mentally, physically, artistry, you know, civics, all that plays into like my physical uh, shape and my frequency. I'm like falling so into music and vibes, you know? How are you staying in like, it has it changed like your your ability to kind of gather your people whether that be your colleagues or your students yeah. um you know like as this sort of like lockdown shut down like where where it's been difficult to gather um you know yeah. you talk about stuff that you do where where it's about gathering people and like how has that changed what you're doing a lot of my youth work approach comes from like a, a Paulo Fieri and the pedagogy of the oppressed. And a lot of his stuff deals with the idea of like meeting people where they're at. You know, there are some uh, spaces that I run online classes virtually with teenagers that they own. Teenagers kind of live in this virtual world and have been doing gaming and chatting and texting and growing up with computers their whole lives. Uh, it really depends on like how you enter into a space and how like you want to like be present and some people they are bringing their presence with them when they chat and try to connect with you so the, i guess to answer the question you got to kind of meet people where they're at send that text try to see if they want to like video chat meet them somewhere reach out uh the idea of like letting go of one hand and holding another hand i've been thinking a lot about that you know letting some hands go who are good and can hold like do their own thing but then when i let go of that hand maybe i might hold myself for a little bit get my energy back up and then go back out and hold someone else's hand that whole theory you know yeah all right i'm going to turn over to the q a we've got some questions from some folks uh, that they want to put to you so corey here we go going to run through a couple of them uh all right this question comes from s uh s asks what do you think about lynn manuel miranda's nod to the history of rap in hamilton um i i love and hate it i i, yeah. I teach hip-hop so i go to some spaces where they're like i love hip-hop and i'm like cool what do you know about it? like we love hamilton and i'm like that's great that's a good place to start you know we could start there um I think he's a genius. I think he writes really well. I think he knows how to put on the production. I mean, it's sold so much and sold out. There's a lot of business things you can learn about it. As far as the production of, of Hamilton, I think that it's a good conversation starter. Just yeah. like any other hip hop piece, you know? Yeah, it's it's like, we gotta put it out there, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
an anonymous attendee wants to know, do you still MC? And if so, where can we see you perform? I'm MCing right now, right in front of you. You can come any day and check me through the video screen. No, I'm just playing. I um, I got, I have a SoundCloud. My name is Sant One. I have a YouTube. I'm not performing anywhere specifically. I'm just like right now creating and, and diving in my self-actualization and revisiting music and hearing it different. Edgar, have you heard any music recently and it's like, it just hit a little different, like some Erica Badu or some like Lauren Hill. And you're just like, wow, this song sounds a little different because of current situations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of the beautiful thing about music, right? Like, I, I talk about this a lot. Like, I, I love new music and I love when new music comes out, but I also love old music and I love, you know, like we live in this 21st century where you have access to like everything that's ever been recorded like at your fingertips, you know? So like, I always say like, if people, like, not that I want it to happen, but if people stopped writing music right now, there's like so much in the back catalogs that you could spend a lifetime listening to that. And that would become new over time based on like what you're going through or what the world's going through. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so people are, people are showing like virtual, like trying to do virtual things too, like virtual presentations and performances. Um, right now I'm just kind of creating personally, but there's a lot of cool stuff going out. There's some great local artists who just dropped some great music, yeah. Jasmine Red, Cliff Notes, um, uh, uh, Red Shades drop the dope album so there's some other people who i'm like really digging and they're digging they're doing their music now too and they definitely deserve some shout outs because it inspires me and i bring it into my classroom and it inspires my kids like that's how it works you know so what is it about hip-hop like you know there's you know and, and i sort of mean this in the most global sense like for you because like hip hip-hop is in one way of looking at it, it's, it's, you could call it like a musical genre. It's a broad one, but it's also a lifestyle. It's a, it's a cultural history. Like, what is it, a, like, what is hip hop? And like, for you, and like, what is the thing about it that like resonates with you? And like, that you want to like reflect back out? Probably the most important thing is this, this, the value, right? Hip hop says that this, these pair of glasses, somebody said that they were trash. I'm gonna take them and wear them like this and they're gonna be like the freshest thing you've ever seen in your life. And I'm gonna give it value, right? So someone's gonna say, that's not real music. That's not like, that's not a belt. That's someone's tie, right? You're like, well, you know, watch next week. Everybody start wearing their ties as a belt, right? You give something value. You. It grew. It started in the space where people didn't have anything. They had a necessity to create. So they took an old turntable and was like, this isn't an instrument, but I'm going to make it an instrument. They took like break dancing, took like capoeira, martial arts, ballet, and acrobatics and was like, we're going to create our own dance style with this. They took words and music and was like, I'm going to take this groove and I'm going to make my own song off of this sample and this groove. So I think at the core of it, it's like, the necessity of having to recreate based off of what you have and then giving it value. Mm. Question from the audience here. What do you love most about working with kids? And maybe give us a little bit more detail about like when you work with kids, are we talking little kids, older kids, everything like at ZoomX, we work from seven through they graduate high school. I have a sweet spot working with teenagers because teenagers are fresh. And what I like working about what I like working about teenagers the most is the fact that they keep me fresh. They keep me like, you know, looking like I'm not my age and you know, <laughs> current and not so ignorant. And they teach me a lot how to listen. You know, I'm, I was really quick to jump in like, my music is better. You know, like you don't know music. I know good music. Yeah. I'm at that age now where I got to listen to their music <laughs> and yeah. what they like. And then I find myself learning a lot. Young people are brilliant, man. If you give them the platform and you give them the opportunity and the support, they can do anything. I know because I lived it. I saw ZoomX go from a $200 budget to like 30 staff and serving th a thousand kids a year, radio station, the whole shebang. I'm like trying to build something in another island that I've never been to. Like I know dreams come true and that's how creative minds work. You know, so, so to have a place where you can nurture a creative mind, it's a beautiful thing. It doesn't really happen in school. And sometimes it doesn't happen at home, which is why the work that we do in the nonprofit arts sector is super important to support. You know, and like get behind and even just introduce people to because it can change lives. What do people get wrong about teenagers, especially those who don't work with them? You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think society as a whole, right? They love to, especially people who don't have teenagers as kids or don't interact with them, love to be like, 
the kids today do this and this other thing wrong. But like you're, you're in a world where you're working with them all the time. What do people get wrong? I, I mean, I think the idea of like trying to be right. That's what they get wrong. Mm. I mean, sometimes young people know what's right and we think that we know what's right for them when they can tell us, we need to create places where they can tell us what, what they think is right for themselves. You know, there's a lot of discussions about reopening schools. I'm like, are we talking to teenagers about reopening schools? Like, where's the focus group for them? Because they're the ones who are going to have to deal with it, not me. I'm not logging on. They're the ones logging on. They have to, like, invest and commit. And then on top of that, like, are we supporting the teachers to support them to want to be engaged? Some of the numbers of engagement of online virtual learning are, like, really scary, you know, like, the systems systems are broke and it's now's a good time to kind of like really get everyone in them to like fix them but uh, i think the answer is to really like listen and like retrain yourself to not think that you know it all because knowing that through life we fail and that's when we learn the most so we got to create opportunities for our young people to like practice failing because they should in, in a safe place to then learn what they want to learn you know how about you? How about you personally in quarantine? I asked this of of Kirsten, but like, what have you have you learned about yourself? Anything in this like period? Like, have you also been going through that like reflecting and taking stock and all of that stuff? Yeah, of course, definitely. I am reassessing myself, like I reappraising myself and my art. Even doing things like showing up today for this, you know, it's like wow, like I am not selling anything but myself and my work. <laughs> like, what am I promoting? I'm promoting the great work and stuff that I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? And stuff that everyone should be doing. I'm finding value. And in, and in that, I then like put my worth into things that give, give back. You know, I'm taking bass, I'm doing music. I'm like learning things, I'm studying. I'm like diving deeper into things that I thought, again, I didn't have time for, I even in some Form, thought I wasn't good for it, you know? Growing up in hip hop, I never thought I'd be like studying classical double bass with a bow, a French bow, and I'm loving it. Something yeah. when I was younger was telling me that that was whack. I don't know why I thought it was whack, but now as an adult, I love it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Corey, I've got a couple, uh, couple more questions for you, but before we do that, we are also uh, almost running out of time. Thanks again to everybody who's been with us. Uh, before I finish up with you with one final, well, two final questions, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome uh, my colleague Alicia back for a couple of words, and then we'll finish things up with Corey. Take it away, Alicia. Hey, I could listen to Corey talk all day. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. And I, gotta, <laughs> I gotta tell you that if you're enjoying this conversation as much as I'm enjoying it, uh, you know, WGBH is here for you and we're making this possible for you because of you, because of the support that you give to WGBH. So I'm encouraging you to make a donation now and you can give $7.50 a month and we will thank you with this t-shirt or you can give a one-time gift of ninety dollars all at once really the everything we do on wgbh the children's programs uh the shows that edgar does on our on on news on 89 7 the classical music everything that happens american experience the entire breadth of everything that's wgbh only happens with your support. So I hope that you've been inspired by today's conversation and you will continue to support these conversations when you go to wgbh.org slash support events. Get yourself a t-shirt or just give. And it's the best way to keep us connected, especially in this time where we really have to stretch our imaginations and creativity. So I want to hear some of these burning questions for Corey. Let's get back to it. All right, thank you, Alicia. Uh, Corey, real quick before we go, these are these are things that are coming from the audience or variations on them. One is people want to know how to interact with you more. So, uh, if I want to uh, donate to ZoomX or I, I want to take a class of some sort or get educated by you in some way, how do I participate with you? The easiest thing you can do is Google my name, uh, Corey Depina. You can find me at ZoomX.org, doing stuff there. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can. Email me, corey.depina at zoomnext.org if you like, and I will try to hook you guys up with some answers and see what you guys are doing. I have some music coming out, hopefully by the end of the summer and the end of the year. So just keep like in touch that way. Cool. And uh, I'm gonna wrap it up with this final question, which is a question I generally hate. So I'm gonna put a little spin on this. This comes from Wills. Wills asked, who are your top five hip hop artists of all time? But I'm gonna ask it a different way and broaden it out because I hate the favorite thing. 
or just pigeonhole it. Give me five records or five whatevers that you recommend that I go check out if I'm into music. Um, I'm gonna jiggle around and give you some, some variety here. Definitely check out the, the Still Gold album, uh, which is a local band. Uh, they have an album called New Normal, which is dope. Um, definitely check out and revisit uh, Nina Simone. She's amazing and inspiring, and during COVID has been somebody that I've been listening to a lot. Esperanza Spalding is just sick and has been inspiring me with the bass and playing bass, such a beautiful yeah. spirit and just amazing. Um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit and definitely, I've been talking to my teens a lot about Billie Eilish and we've been studying Billie Eilish a lot and uh, she's very inspirational and is just a brilliant and a talent and I think my kids like them so much that I've started to like Billie Eilish this summer, which is dope. <laughs> and then we're going to throw in an oddball band. With Niles Barkley, uh, CeeLo Green, and, and Danger Mouse, the Niles Barkley, uh, just the, that duo is uh, something that I always go back to. There was a summer when we took kids on tour all around New England, and that was the soundtrack. So I, I, this summer, I'm missing that soundtrack because we're not touring all around New England. So that, I've been going back to that album a lot, too. All right. Corey DePina, thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Give us a little window into your world, and I uh, really appreciate it. That was a blessing. Thank you, guys. All right. And thanks to everybody for joining us for uh, At Home with the Curiosity Desk. Uh, it's been great being with you for the last hour. My thanks again to Kirsten and Corey. Uh, keep an eye on your email because uh, we're going to send you some follow-up with some links on how you can stay connected to Kirsten and Corey and myself with the Curiosity Desk. So for now, uh, well, you don't have to go home safe because I assume you are already at home like I have been the whole time. But thank you for taking the time to be with us. Keep your eyes open on your email because we'll be doing this again. And I uh, really appreciate uh, taking the time to be with us. So everybody stay safe and stay cool out there because it is hot. <laughs>